you're going to be riding your bike in the dark. You need lights, but which lights do you need? I mean, there's loads of different types out there, varying from just a few pounds or dollars, right up to hundreds of your respective currencies. So in this video, I'm going to explain all the different types of lights, the different features that are on them and what they're for so that you can best decide what kind of lights you need for the riding that you do. But before I do that, make sure that you subscribe to GCN if you haven't already and click the bell icon to get notifications as it helps support the channel and the content we make. Firstly, we'd always recommend that you use at least two lights, a red rear one and a white front one. This is actually the law in many countries, but irrespective of that, it'll just keep you safer. And I said at least two because I'd recommend you use more. And this is for a couple of reasons. The first one is that if one of your lights fails or the battery runs out, you've got a backup. And the second reason is it'll just make you even more visible to other road users and therefore safer. The next thing to be aware of is that front lights fall broadly into two categories, lights to be seen and lights to see with. Rear lights aren't really used for seeing on bikes because I mean, well, no one really reverses on a bike. Beep, 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 beep. If you're going to be riding on lit roads in an urban environment, then a light that enables other people to see you, such as this one, is going to be sufficient. They're generally less bright, but less expensive than more powerful lights that are designed to illuminate your path on unlit roads. But how do you know how bright a light is? Well, the SI unit lumens is used to measure how bright a light is, and it's usually written on the side of the box. But what is a lumen, I hear you ask? Well, the lumen is the SI-derived unit of luminous flux, which is the amount of visible light given by a given source per unit of time. Luminous flux differs from radiant flux, as radiant flux is the total light given across all wavelengths, whereas luminous flux is weighted towards the wavelengths that are visible by the human eye. And lumens are related to lux in that one lux is one lumen per square meter. So now you know. Now to put that into context, car headlights are typically 1200 lumens. The landing lights on a commercial jet are around 5,500 lumens and the bat signal is 525,000 lumens. Yep, I'm great fun at parties. Now within the context of bike lights, they typically range between 50 and 2,000 lumens. And to be seen lights are typically between 50 and 200 lumens. We've got a couple of examples here. So this is a front one from Cat Eye, and on the back, I've got an exposure rear light as well that's around 50 lumens. If you're going to be riding on unlit roads, then I'd personally recommend something around the 800 lumen mark at least. You can go less bright, but ultimately you're going to feel safer and more confident the more you can see. This cat eye vault is, well, 800 lumens, it says 800 on the side of it. If you're going to be riding off-road, then you're going to want brighter still, starting at at least the 1000 lumen mark and upwards. So this is a Top Eat QB, about 1200 lumens, and this cat eye vault, whopping 1600 lumens on this one. But be aware, if you do have a super powerful light, tilt it downwards when on roads and maybe on a lower setting at times, as some car headlamps are 1,200 lumens when on full beam. You don't want to blind the driver of the 18-wheeler Mack truck coming towards you at 60 miles an hour. 
So things to look for on lights. Firstly, flashing modes and different modes uh, for the beam. Now these are useful because when you switch to a flashing mode, it makes your battery last longer. Also, if you've got a super bright light like this one, then you don't need it on super bright all the time. So when you come onto a lit road, you can switch to flashing mode and save your battery. Beam pattern visibility. You don't want to be just visible directly head on and directly from behind. Consider lights that offer side visibility too, or consider adding some additional lights that offer some brightness from the sides. This is because it's unfortunate, but most accidents tend to happen at junctions. So this is important. It's also worth bearing in mind that some countries apply strict restrictions to bike lights based on the beam pattern. Germany springs to mind first. Even if you're not bound by law to have certain types of lights, some are designed to throw light really wide to illuminate off-road trails. Again, meaning that they can dazzle oncoming road users. Exposure strata lights have a beam pattern modelled on a cars and allow you to dip the beam at the push of a remote button, which could prove useful on unlit roads. The cheapest lights tend to have changeable disposable batteries, but personally I'd recommend getting one with an inbuilt USB rechargeable battery. This means that if you perhaps commute, you're less likely to get caught out because you can charge it at work and make sure that it's always got juice. And although they cost a little bit more initially, over time, not having to constantly buy new batteries makes them more cost effective. Battery life. Now bigger, more expensive lights tend to have bigger batteries and last longer. And make sure you pick a light that has sufficient battery life for your planned ride, and ideally longer. This QBQB light from Topeak's really good because it has a modular battery that you can remove and there's different size ones too. If you're out for epic ultra endurance rides, you could always look at a Dynamo front hub which generates electricity from the movement of your front wheel and allows you to charge or just power some pretty hefty lights as you ride. Mounting options. So lights can be mounted to bikes in different ways. The two most common methods are either with rubber straps like this or with brackets like this. And ideally you want a light that's fairly easy to remove and take off because if you're commuting with it, you don't want to leave your light strapped onto your bike while you go to work because undesirable naughty people will probably steal it if you leave it on. Being easy to remove and put back on is also useful for taking off if you want to charge it. And if you're going to go for a bracket, go for a good quality one like this that's going to help hold it on securely because a loose fitting one is really annoying because it'll create a rattle as you ride along. Ugh. There's loads of different lighting options out there these days. My saddlebag even has a light built into it and it's quite good for side visibility too. You just press it like that. How cool is that? The final thing to consider is where you're going to be mounting the light and what kind of bike you have and making sure you get one that fits. So for example, a lot of modern performance road bikes now have fancy aerodynamic shaped handlebars and seat posts. And this can make fitting traditional lights that rely on a round uh, handlebar or round seat post problematic. Fortunately, there are plenty of lights that work and I'd suggest going for something with a stretchy rubber mount like this, uh, as that is generally fine at fitting on a non-round post. Or you could go for an action cam style mount, uh, such as this on the Topeak light I've got on the front here. Either way, there are loads of different products out there. Just make sure you pick something that works for your bike. 
Right, I hope you found this look at bike lights useful and I hope you've learned something. And if you have, please give this video a thumbs up. And if you'd like to head over to the GCN shop and grab yourself one of the greatest hoodies available to humanity, well, you can do. My favourite, the navy and white, is in stock. And if you'd like to watch another video on Dynamo Hubs, you can click down here.